Welcome back to the Young Shakespeare Podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of talking to Thomas Perel. He is a BBNN football and lax star, graduated, and he's headed to Notre Dame to play lacrosse. Uh, four-star rated by Insider Lacrosse. Thomas, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me, Dan. What was the decision like to commit to Notre Dame? Honestly, pretty easy. Um, I mean, when when you're getting a call from Coach Corrigan, you you, you, you listen. So <laughs> he, he kind of gave me the spiel about what ND was about, what the culture was, uh, what the school had to offer me, like whether it was on the field, off the field, and even after college. So when, like, when you – when I'm growing up in a, in a place like Massachusetts and you, and you're watching college football, like my dad went to BC and I'd gone to a couple of BC ND games and you kind of, kind of start to like dream about and like manifest playing at ND school, like ND and you see the golden dome and the touchdown Jesus. And you're like, wow, that looks like, it looks like a dream. And when, when they gave me the opportunity I just I couldn't turn that down. I mean, I had a bunch of great schools like BU, Harvard, Yale, a couple other places that uh, gave me opportunities. But um, I mean, Corrigan, Wellner, and uh, Coach Wojcik, they all they sold me really well on it, and uh, it was just a place that I could not turn down. Yeah, yeah, I hundred percent know what you're talking about. My dad used to take me out to BC Notre Dame when I was a little kid. I just it was the, like the most special memories that I ever have. And then those two teams, they just get kind of solidified in your, in your head, like that, a kid growing up around here. Um, right. Coach Corrigan calling you, does it instill a lot of confidence knowing it's a guy that's been there for so long and had so much success, just knowing like, Hey, this is, this is the the man basically at Notre Dame. Like I know a lot of guys will look for that in a coaching staff. Like how long have they been together? How long have they been at that school to just, really know where their future stands yeah it was definitely reassuring knowing that he's been there for a while he's got a system that's obviously been successful in the past so um knowing that that I'm getting thrown into a very successful program that has the best interest in me and and everybody else on the team is uh it's really nice knowing that absolutely it seems too like the Notre Dame style across kind of suits you they want guys who can run the field um they want middies that can ride and do a whole bunch of things do you also agree that that's kind of favorable to your style did that at all factor into that choice for you yeah I mean I think for me my game isn't really like centered around offense or anything like that like I feel like for me, once I get there, I'll obviously build those skills and put them in my arsenal. But um, throughout like middle school and high school, my game was always like being athletic, making plays between the lines, like causing turnovers, uh, like leading a defense. And I mean, obviously offense is where it all happens and like where you get all the goals and stuff. But I mean, I was able to to find a different a different way to impact the game and and uh, I, f I, f I do agree with you that uh, that style that Notre Dame has and their midfielders like like Costabile, Perkovic, all those big rangy athletes that they have running in the middle of the field, like Ryan Hallenbach, mm -hmm. just graduated this year. Um, he was, a, I mean, in my mind, probably the best short stick D midi in the country. Um, yeah, I, I do think that that is very favorable for me. And, Mm -hmm. something that I'm really excited about because I, I love getting up and down the field, like making stuff happen. Absolutely. Yeah. A lot of folks know you had a lot of success as a football player. Do you think that aggression, you know, playing as a safety, um, that aggression just throughout youth and high school lacrosse kind of translates over where you're able to make those aggressive plays or do you think it, there's a little bit more to it? No, I, I definitely think it does translate. I mean, when you're, when you're playing football and you, you're looking across, the line and you see someone that your job is to pretty much physically assault them it's like <laughs> it, it's like it gets real between <clears throat> the there but um I, I definitely think of myself as like a football player first who just happens to like run up and down a field with a stick in my hand like it, I mean I, I love the way I play it's very physical uh it, honestly for me it's nice knowing that it gets the team juiced up. It gets all the fellas juiced up mm -hmm. making a, whether it's like making a big hit, making something that impacts like the way that, uh, that you can like take away the momentum from the other team or just, I don't know, it's just something about it that, that makes me 
get all juiced up and fired up. Yeah. How would you describe your style as a player? Um, definitely rangy, athletic. Uh, that's one thing I, I pride myself on is just trying to be a, the most athletic kid on the field. Um, I know it's going to be different getting up there and being around all these great athletes, but I mean, it's going to have to be hunkered down and, and keep working at it. But um, I think that the work ethic is what kind of sets me up. I've been fortunate enough, like my dad's kind of instilled in me, like get in the weight room, get to the field. Mm-hmm. First of all, get all your schoolwork done before you go do that or else I won't let you go. But <laughs> um, like that, that's definitely allowed me to gain confidence in being able to do all those things and be able to make plays. So mm-hmm. definitely, that's definitely the way I love to play. Right. I'm glad you brought up your dad. Cause I think a lot of people would be wondering, you know, he played at BC, he played in the NFL. Yep. What kind of was that experience like growing up with a role model like that and someone that has experienced football and uh, athletics at the highest level? It's definitely really cool. I mean, when you have someone at your disposal who's played at the highest level, I mean, for me growing up, I've always wanted to play football at the highest level. So mm-hmm. knowing that I had someone that I could like, go to and and pick his brain and really understand what it meant to, to make it to that, to that level was, it's, it's different because not a lot of kids do, do have that. So I'm honestly very grateful for that because I think it set me up for, for success in the long run yeah I bet when you were younger you always won the my dad could beat up your dad game <laughs> all right my dad used to be huge he's uh he slimmed down recently but uh he used to be a big fella yeah oh yeah, yeah. How big? I want to say in his heyday when he was playing he he played at like 280 but he was like Damn. a jack 280 <laughs> according to him he could he could break down into a full split. So he wasn't just a big guy. No way. <laughs> yeah. He was a, he was an athletic big guy who could uh, bend and get around blocks and bench press off big, big bodies and all that stuff. <laughs> you know? In his heyday, when he, when I was growing up, he must've gotten up pretty big. I'm not going to label a number to it, but uh, <laughs> yeah. but he got up there and, and it was, you wouldn't, you wouldn't realize it when you saw it, when you see him until he stepped on the scale and was right in your face. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, I mean, any of my buddies who uh, grew up with me would tell you that uh, he was a presence. Yeah. I actually, funny enough, I can do a full split and it, really? it freaks people out, but it, I'll be at, like the bars with my friends and like, like one of those dance kind of bars and they're like, do a split, do a split. I come home. My mom is like, why are there all these rips in your pants? And so I yeah, like, mom they told me to do a split I couldn't tell him no like it's such a weird thing to be able to do I want one time I I said that exact thing I was like I go oh you don't see a lot of big guys doing splits and this I just overhear this girl behind me she goes you don't see a lot you don't see any guys doing splits <laughs> such a such a weird thing to have um so you kind of have that figure growing up in the game of football what yep. got you onto lacrosse what was that lacrosse journey like um, my dad actually played when he was in high school. Uh, he was he played deep hole and he was much like me. Like, I mean, when I was growing up, I was always trying to just like light kids up. Like, I wasn't very skilled at, at lacrosse mm-hmm. very early. I was always just trying to lay the wood, um, just like like I was playing football. But uh, I mean, I started playing in first grade, and I absolutely hated it because I mean, when you pick up a stick for the first time. You're like, what the heck do I do with this? <laughs> like, how do I use it? Yeah. You try throwing and then you either falls out the back of your stick or you end up throwing it right into the dirt. And you're like, dude, this sucks. But then that's, I mean, that like that hate and, and like, why the hell am I bad at this is like kind of what makes you hungry to like, want to go get better at it. So I guess that's why I was, that's where I got the want to like get better and, mm-hmm and like go to the field consistently get on the wall and then kind of like tone my skills in and make sure that I wasn't bad at it. Cause I mean, when anybody will tell you, they hate being the worst at something. So when you're the worst at something and you, and you have the the want to get better at it, you're going to, you're going to get better at it. Yeah. So you've always been competitive like that. Right. Very interesting. And 
what was the move like to go over to BBN, BBNN? Was that at all driven by sports, the opportunity to play football or play lacrosse in the ISL? Yeah, so um, I used to play on this all-star football team in middle school called uh, FBU, which I think that now they just call it Mass Elite. Yeah, I used to play FBU. I know about that. Really? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. I loved FBU. I loved every minute of it. But um, so I was playing FBU and I was wearing my Littleton – Littleton Tigers football helmet, like running around. I mean, I, like anybody would tell, I was just the smallest kid on the FBU team. Like I come from, I was like one of the bigger kids out in my youth program, like lighting kids up on the field. And then, you, and then you really see what the real talent is around the state. And yeah. I walk into practice and I'm like, holy sh, like holy crap, I'm tiny. <laughs> but like, I guess, I guess me realizing I'm tiny and being like, well, what am I going to do about this? And just like putting my head down, like just going laying boom, boom sticks on all these kids. Mm-hmm. Next thing I know, I got coach Willie coming up to my dad and I asking what, what my plans are and like what I, what my aspirations are. And I'm, and he starts selling BBNN to me. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> it sounds pretty good. Like, yeah, I'd love, to, I'd love to do that. So he was the one that recruited me, coach Willie. And um, I mean, for most people who, if most people aren't familiar with coach Willie, he's a, he's a salesman for sure. He'll, yeah, uh, yeah. he's a presence. Water, he could sell water to a fish if he wanted to. <laughs> um, he, he got me an interview. He got me in front of a bunch of administrators and honestly, BBNN was the only school I ever applied to. I took the SSAT and then I ended up getting in uh, during seventh grade. I reclassed uh, once I got there. So I wow. did seventh grade again. But um, it was probably the best decision I ever made. Making That's, wild. Decision. That's wild. Was he yeah. there as a coach or literally was he scouting like middle school FBU? Um, so, I mean, FBU always brought in all these prep school coaches to come coach. I mean, you when you're train when you're working with a bunch of the best kids in the state, you want to bring in the best coaches too. Mm-hmm. So um, he would always come coach. He was a I mean, unbelievable O-line coach. So he was always working with the O-line and my dad was also an O-line coach. So they got to talking. My dad introduced me to the idea of switching to a ISL school. Mm. Then I became interested. So I started talking to him, but um, I mean, he, it was like a no brainer yeah. when, when, when he came in and uh, kind of brought up the idea to me. Yeah. And then you come over, you reclass in seventh grade. Yeah. What was the initial experience like changing over to a private school, uh, you know, a, a high level school? What was that intimidating? Were you nervous at first? Uh, definitely nervous, but nervous in the way that like just academics, there are way more rigorous than at a school like Littleton Middle School. And mm-hmm. I mean, Littleton Middle School is a very, very good uh, public school. But I mean, when Coach Willie was was uh, interviewing me, he was telling me like, it's like a treadmill. Littleton Middle School is running like this, and then when you get to BBNN, you're going to be running like this. So you're moving a lot faster in the classroom. You're getting a lot more stuff packed onto your schedule. So mm-hmm. it was definitely a transition, and uh, that was the one thing I was really nervous for. Because I mean, middle school, I never really applied myself as much as I really should have. Right. So going in, I was like. I was kind of freaking out thinking, Oh man, am I going to like flunk out of here? Am I going to be in a bad spot? Like in my middle school gonna... dropout. Yeah. My, my parents <laughs> gonna end up freaking killing me cause I'm not getting my work done. <laughs> but then, and then I uh, start hunkering down, getting all my work done. I'm realizing like, it's really not that hard. It's just like how much time and effort I put into yeah. it, really what I'm going to get out of it. So it's just like sports. It's just right. like sports in that way. Exactly. A lot of athletes, if you can learn to work hard at one thing, you should be able to apply it to the rest of your life. But then it's always like, oh, well, I'm not as passionate about science as I am about lacrosse. It's like, well, you, if you want to do well at science, you have to pretend you are, you know, you have to take all those extra steps you would. What right. was the progression as far as football and lacrosse went during that seventh, eighth, grade year freshman sophomore year so in seventh and eighth grader because bbnn for it works where the middle school is seventh and eighth grade so um i came in as a new middle schooler and 
progression worked where I was still playing on my youth, my Littleton youth football teams. Mm. I was like two, double timing with Littleton youth football and then BBNN middle school football. So oh. I, and honestly, the hardest part of the transition was like waking up at like 545 as a middle school kid, like, like sluggish, cranky, like, I don't want to do this. Get, having my dad bust me over to Concord is where, where I got the shuttle bus that took me into school at 645 and then getting to school by 730. And I'm like, holy crap, like, is this what I really got to do to go to the school? And uh, be long days. I mean, I didn't get out of school until like three o'clock. Then mm -hmm. I'd go have practice until like four o'clock. Sure. And I'm, I'm back on the bus going back to Concord. Dad picks me up go straight to football practice. I'm like, holy crap. Like, am I even going to be able to get all my homework done? Like literally the one thing that my parents told me to do is get my homework done. And I'm <laughs> playing football more than I'm like even looking at my laptop or notebooks. That's a crazy sketch. You were on two football teams. And you just yeah, it was crazy. All day long. Why, why did you play on two teams and not just one? Um, My Littleton team, I mean, I had so many best friends from Littleton and yeah. my dad had always coached my grade in football. So I, like, I couldn't leave that. I couldn't leave that and kind of feel satisfied knowing that like all my best buddies are still playing. And like, I never got to finish out like our, at least our middle school career playing together. Mm. We, I mean, we always had an unreal team. Um, I mean, out, out by this way, we were always competitive, like playing in the central mass super bowl and all that. Yeah. So uh, once I repeated in eighth grade, all my buddies were or repeat in seventh grade, all my buddies were eighth graders. So that one year that I had with my old grade, was oh. one of the best years of football we ever had. We made it to a Super Bowl, fortunately lost in a six nothing thriller. <laughs> um hey that's that's smash mouth football dude that's defense it is, it is. i'd like to see that eighth grade game it was unreal but um i mean finishing that out was was awesome because all my buddies then went to high school while i was still in eighth grade mm -hmm. um they got to transition into playing with all the big boys and and then uh i actually played when i went into eighth grade at bbnn i uh i played on a I don't know if you're familiar with Neshoba. It's a region out by me. It's like the towns of Bolton, Stone, Lancaster. Mm -hmm. I played on a team called the Neshoba Chiefs, where we pretty much didn't have enough players from Littleton, Neshoba, Groton, Westford. Like yeah. all these towns around us didn't have enough players for their own town. So we combined into one team. So I'm going into eighth grade with a – brand new youth football team with kids that I don't even know we start out in early August um play all the way until December because we end up making it to nationals beating and uh, I don't know them too well but like Pop Watson Joe Griffin all those guys <laughs> end up beating them in the regional you beat the, those guys from Springfield Central beat all those guys <laughs> while they were in eighth grade beat them in the uh, New England regional that punched our ticket to, to nationals and uh, we uh, go down to nationals and we were just, it, it was almost like that game was a fluke because I mean, we were, I, to me, we were just a tougher team. I mean, it was like 30 degrees with like an eight degree wind chill playing a bunch of these athletic freaks thinking we're going to get blown out. I mean, my dad would tell you like after the game, my dad goes, Whole, like holy crap I thought we were gonna get blown out like before the game we was telling all the coaches like I hope this doesn't get too ugly blah 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 like I I really hope they don't mercy rule us <laughs> end up coming out I I used to play quarterback in eighth grade too end up throwing a game winning touchdown with 20 seconds left no kidding punch our, punch our ticket to natties it was unreal I mean I got a video of the very last offensive play where I we ran a uh, play action pass I play action I rolled out my buddy Connor was our fullback he was a big dude running the football and he can move he uh lights up the d end and then and then trickles out into the flat we we're on like the five yard line I just give him a nice little loft pass catches it and we all just go crazy 
it was unbelievable. It was one of the best moments. Wild. Yeah, the team, the best of the rest of them go and make it all the way to nationals. Just all these guys from different towns. That's pretty awesome. That's Can't pretty say awesome. we did too well at nationals, but. <laughs> That's neither here nor there. So you have that successful eighth grade season. And then what's it like trying to step up and play varsity sports? So eighth grade was the first time I hurt my shoulder. That's the first time it popped out. Mm -hmm. Messed up to think about as an eighth grader. But um, so I go into freshman year. I mean, I was kind of, I was kind of more invested in lacrosse. At the, I was starting to get, become more invested in lacrosse at the time. Um, I wasn't, in the weight room as much as like maybe 175 pounds at like six foot two so I'm like a scrawny little kid slotted to go start as a freshman at safety and uh I just was not mature enough yet to to play but I I step in I try to make as many plays as possible um I mean when you're playing as a freshman in the ISL you're either freakishly fast freakishly big or you're just – you have a cannon of an arm. And I did not have any three of those, so I'm like, what am I doing? Like, what am I yeah. doing in the field right now? And then I just realized, like, th like this is the sport, like, I play. Like, this is this is what I do. So I, did, I tried making as many plays as possible. I mean, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. But then I, I kind of got a rude awakening from Coach Willie. He'll, if you ask Coach Willie, he'll, he calls him a full Coach Willie when he gets up in your face and kind of <laughs> – let you know what you need to do, whether he's screaming or not. But um, yeah, I got a full coach Willie one time and that kind of set me straight. Yeah. But in the weight room, got faster, got stronger, got bigger. And then once it came to uh, sophomore year, I started making more plays, kind of cemented my spot on defense, um, played a little receiver. I wasn't as fast as I should have been, according to my dad, but. I was, I was making yeah. enough plays. I was making stuff happen. But then, uh, I mean, once COVID hit, once COVID hit, my bet, my best buddy, Richie, who was uh, from Littleton, we hunkered down. He ended up getting a bench press in his room. Mm -hmm. So we're like, oh, we can't do anything. We can't go to a public, public gym. We can't, like, they shut down the fields at in Littleton. We can't really do much. So I'd go on online school for three hours each day hop in the car I just got my license so I hop in my car drive to Richie's house lift weights for hour and a half then we go run sprints or like run a mile around yeah. his, his little his apartment complex or condo mm -hmm. complex mm -hmm. and then uh his mom who is a phenomenal cook phenomenal cook would chef up some crazy meals and we just eat till we couldn't eat anymore I ended up going from like 170 to 200 pounds in the span of like two or three months, mm. like just packing on muscle, packing on all this stuff. And I didn't, I didn't slow down or anything. Like I got to maintain my speed if anything got faster. And then I started once uh, the fields opened up, started getting out there, throwing with my QB and all that stuff. My buddy Jared was our QB at the time. Mm -hmm. And then we get the call that junior year football is canceled. And that was a big punch in the gut because, I mean, I that was the most prepared I've ever been for any, any sport in my life. Like, that's when I really realized what, like, hard work was. Was, yeah. uh, just like, <clears throat> like, just staying in the weight room pretty much. Because, I mean, as a football player, you got to pretty much live in the weight room if you want to play at the next level. So, mm. that's, pretty, that's pretty much where it all started. Damn. Yeah, it's quite – it's just quite a journey there from that freshman getting the full willy to that place where you're so ready. And there's that disappointment of not being able to play football. And I do remember vaguely, I think around that time at that point of the pandemic was when people were really not sure there was a kind of a split about kids were fighting. They were saying we deserve, you know, MIA, ISL, we're ready to go. The fall will be fine. And certain sports, I don't know the ISL, but in the MIA, they chalked it up and did like four different seasons. There was a fall yeah. one and a fall two. And the MIA kids were actually allowed to play football, just with shortened seasons. So they got like, I want to say five or six games, most teams. Yeah. Um, and then only certain sports could play in the fall. It was like soccer. However, they sorted it out. 
that was a point where you weren't really sure what was going to happen. So I can only imagine how blowing that must have been. During that year, were you able to participate in lacrosse? What was that journey like when you had gotten in that phenomenal shape and then took that blow? Yeah, so we actually, we were able to play like a seven on seven season that fall. Mm. But then, I mean, once once that seven on season, seven on seven season was over, that's when I have a trainer who uh, I used to work at a gym in Northboro called EPS. My trainer, Dan, his name's Dan Gluck. He's the man. Um, mm-hmm. He got me in even better shape. Like I went from like 200 to 210 of just muscle and, and fast and all this stuff. So in, during the winter to prepare me for the lacrosse season. And I, that must've been the best shape I've ever been in like ever mm. until now. But um, going into that junior year lacrosse season, we're like wearing masks under our helmets. Like this is BS. Why <laughs> the heck do we have to do this? We're outside. Like that was the weirdest thing too. Cause you, everyone had like helmets on in different sports and then the mat, I was like, what's that, that going to do with the helmets? <laughs> it was ridiculous. But um, one, <laughs> it, that was a good season. I mean, we had, we had one of our better teams at BBNN. We've never been the strongest program. I think a lot of people would say that. But um, <laughs> we had a lot of good players. We had, uh, I mean, Jack, Jack Papp, obviously, Max Ewald, Nico Berger, um, just a, t- a ton of good talent that that's playing at the next level. Um, but, uh, I mean, obviously, when you go one in 15, you're never satisfied with that. So, hmm that left a little sour taste in the mouth going into the, uh, going into the summer. Yeah. That's a weird situation to be in where like you're going to Notre Dame, Jack's going to Duke, like great lacrosse players on a team that is in a highly competitive league and isn't at the level of those other teams. That, that must've been like you were talking about being competitive earlier. That must've been very frustrating throughout the season. Yeah. That's a, a lot of doubts went through our minds during that season. But I mean, with those doubts come the realization that, I mean, in order to play in the ISL, you got to have some support. Mm. Like no matter how good one kid can be, there are teams like St. Seb's, Belmont Hill, that Nobles, um, I could, I could list the whole league. Yeah. <laughs> it is littered with talent. I mean, ISL has got to be a top, five top 10 league in the country and when you're playing with with a bunch of kids that aren't even true lacrosse players Mm -hmm. it's hard to to compete with teams that have kid like rosters with seven or seven and even like 11 kids going to division one programs yeah that's kind of what alex dixon was saying on the podcast too he's an ohio state commit Right, um, and he was playing for Brooks, um, so that's a was it Brooks? I think yep. it was. Yeah, so that was a kind of a similar situation. And he said it kind of was he was learning bad habits, like the way defenses were trying to like lock him out, different things. Like he was having, he was learning ways to adapt to the system he was in, but he was like, this just isn't what D one lacrosse will look like for me, and that's why he moved over to Case Western. Yeah. So it's a tough. So going in, you know, you're maybe questioning a little bit, but it's still the ISL. And then you go into that summer. Um, I think you were with 3D Red. Is that right that summer? Yeah. What was that whole slate of tournaments and games like? So that summer, I actually, that was the summer I had my knee done mm. because we were in a game against Lawrence Academy, the last game of the season. Um, third quarter end up feeling a little pop in my knee and I'm like like, shit like yeah can't be happening right now it wasn't like anything too bad like kept kept playing like I could run I could somewhat cut like it was tolerable the pain wasn't crazy I mean that was probably just most of the adrenaline working for me but um I'm like I'm like I remember like Jack scoring a goal and we're like Nico, Jack, and I are celebrating, and I like I like pull them into me, and I'm like, <coughs> I'm like, yeah, like you guys are gonna have to do a lot here. Like I'm hobbling over here. Like I can't do too much with this leg. 
and uh, I was I don't know if you've ever seen the clip that of that Maz videos took of me mm. of me getting airborne, but oh yes, yes, yeah, I did that on on that bad knee, like completely torn meniscus, torn in two spots, and I was tapped enough to get up there and and use the bunnies to to score that one goal, but Jeez. that was, clearly wasn't enough to win the game. We ended up losing that, and then I get the knee done. Um, were you jumping? Was, were you jumping off the knee? Yeah, that had the torn meniscus. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> but then, yeah, that 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 didn't feel good. But I can't imagine it was an incredible goal. But yeah. it looked it looked good. It looked good. Yeah. It looked real good. Even I thought it looked real good. But um, going into that summer, I mean, we were slated for some big tournaments. Mm-hmm. We, I mean, I. I was in, I was on crutches for most of it. So we would go to, we went to Crab Feast down in Maryland, ended up losing in the semifinals of that tournament. Honestly, I remember Chad Palumbo played with us in that tournament. Yeah. And I had never seen such like creative, like smooth plays from a kid who had just like thrown on a 3D jersey, had previously played for Clams, had been playing for with, with mm-hmm. West Coast Stars throws on the 3d jersey and he's just like got the, all the confidence of the world like <laughs> behind the back game winner like two between the legs right into the top corners and i'm screaming my head off on the sideline like conducting a little bit of the defense and then we go down on offense and chad scores these unbelievable goals and i'm just like losing my mind trying not to jump up and down because i'm like i can't really jump right now <laughs> chad making it hard for me not to freaking lose my mind right now like this is unreal what you're doing <laughs> But uh, that that was one of the f- most fun tournaments I've ever yeah. gone through. I mean, that team we brought down there, just all the guys that we uh, that were on the team prior to even me joining, um, just a bunch of solid guys. I mean, I, I love that that group of guys, um, just a bunch of gritty kids. So yeah. we, we would always just get into it with all these teams, like trying to dig ourselves out of holes, and we we would always do it and and end up making some like storybook type ending. But uh, I mean, we we lost a close OT winner with uh I don't know if you're familiar with a club called Mesa. Can't say I am. They're uh I want to say Pennsylvania Pennsylvania club out out by Philly. Um, they gave us a real good game, but uh, I mean that that was a tough pill to swallow knowing that that because that was the last summer that we were playing club lacrosse too. So it was a little tough pill to swallow knowing that I couldn't get my last club summer. Yeah. So I think a lot of people would be interested to hear what was the timeline of recruitment for a guy that can't play that last summer? Were you relying solely on the high school tape you had? Well, I had already been committed at that point because with COVID, everything kind of got rushed. Uh, so once once September 1st hit, um, going into my junior year, mm-hmm. we, we actually played – my 3D team played in a uh, an event called the Elite Eight down in uh, the 76ers Field House in Delaware. Yeah, I've heard of that. <clears throat> so we played the first game. We played 91 Maryland, lost a close one to them. Uh, played played a close game with Juice Cherries and uh, lost that one. And then we played a team called DC Express that always had our number. But um, it was a great show. And, I mean, a lot of our guys put on a show for all these coaches that were watching, whether they were able to come out and watch in person or they were watching over live stream. But um, that event actually led into September 1st, into midnight. And that's actually when I got my first call. Mike Salippo from BU called me, who's a, who a great – I love Mike Salippo. He's a great guy. Um, he – gave me a call like letting me know what what the deal was and then that's kind of where the train started rolling um I spent the night in the hotel with Jack both on the phone with all these (laughs) and um I'm I'm, like in the bathroom and he's on in the on his bed like on the phone just so we're not like talking over each other I can only imagine how many calls you two are getting oh yeah I mean it was it was it it didn't stop until like 1 30 a couple a couple schools called late night but then it was the next day that it kind of ramped up. And um, the first time 
Coach Wojcik at ND called me. He was with Ryder Garnsey, and they were up in the uh, Notre Dame football stadium. And then they got the phone, like, panning it over the stadium, like, showing me what I was missing out on. And I'm like, wow, this is Oh, my God. And I'm honestly, when they called me that first day, I was driving back from Delaware with my parents. And that was the first time I heard from them. And then I actually didn't hear from them for, like, two weeks. And I don't know if you're familiar with um, this kid from Long – he's not from Long – he plays on – 91 bandits now his name's brock Behrman. yeah yeah he goes to salisbury right yeah so he he adds me i like i knew of him prior and i didn't think he knew of me so he adds me on snapchat while i'm at school it's like one of the first weeks of school and he starts texting me he's like dude like notre dame question mark like what how are you feeling about this <laughs> i'm like dude like i haven't heard anything from them in so long it'd be unreal to go there like that'd be a dream come true like he's like, I'm gonna make it happen. He literally tells me, I'm gonna make it happen. He tells Coach Wellner, he tells Corrigan. Then the next day, I got a Zoom call with him. Th- a Thursday night, I got a Zoom call with all three coaches and my family. And then they they hit me with the offer, and I was like, Brock, you are the man. Like you, I owe everything to you right now because this is unbelievable. That's incredible. It was insane. It was like it was like they put it was like they put him up to it. But I, I, crazy shit. Was it just wow? Because he's such a high level player, all American. Right. Was it the trust they had in him? Nope. That he knew you as a player. Why do you think they responded to him, uh, saying you got to talk to like what? I don't like. I'm so lost. Like, what did he do? How did how did he make that happen? I I don't know if if they told him to make something happen or he did he did this on his own and let them know about it, but. He was the first kid because he used to be in our, in my grade. He used to be a 22 before he uh, reclassed to Salisbury. But um, he was the first kid in my class to commit to ND, I think. I might be wrong. But he was one of the first commits. And he just hits me up one day out of the blue. And I don't. I, I honestly couldn't tell you if the coaches told him to or, or he. it was just his idea. But he must have seen something in me that not a lot of other ki- people saw. And uh, I'm honestly grateful for that because him and I are pretty close now. I mean, yeah. I talk to him pretty often, not not too much. But um, now that he's going to be at 23 and he'll come in next year. So we'll get to uh, rip it up at South Bend. So Right. So you think it, there's also a possibility the coaches were interested and they're like, hey, what do you – can you gauge this guy see, and right. see where he's at? Right. I mean, I've had – Coach Wellner even has told me, like, make sure these guys don't get flipped. Like, I don't know if you know Jordan Fajon. Um, he's, I don't think, I don't he's, think I do, but he goes to the Pinecrest School in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. When, like, when I, when you talk about just a sick athlete, like, that kid is unbelievable. Like, hmm. and he's, he, he runs through defense like a hot knife through butter. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he, he, I remember after committed combine, Coach Wellner co- came out to watch us. We it was Brock, Jordan, and I on a team, and um, Coach Wellner pulls me to the side and he's like, he's like, if if any of these guys think about about uh, flipping, like you kick their ass. So I'm like, <laughs> I got I got you, and I'm like, I'm significantly bigger than both these kids. And, and Coach <laughs> Wellner's like, I I know I can trust you. And I'm like, right, you got a lot of trust in your players, Coach. He's like, of course I do. So just like the the trust that that these coaches have in their players to, to whether it's like out on the field or or like keeping keeping the the recruiting classes stable, it's 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 honestly special. So mm-hmm. that's it's also one thing that I love about it. Yeah, you're a guy that's kind of got a foot in each uh, side of this. What's your opinion on football versus lacrosse recruiting? the social media aspect of it because in football all these prospects oh hey i just uh i just took a visit to notre dame oh i just got an offer from notre dame oh i just pissed in the urinal at ohio state like yeah. kids will post everything they do in right. football related to recruiting lacrosse there's nothing on social media about it why do you right. think the difference and which system do you like better um 
I think the, the biggest difference is just the funding that the programs have. I mean, when you look at a, a college football team, they have 80 scholarships. I mean, depending on what school it is, but most, I think on average, it's like 80 scholarships um, for each team. And they're carrying like 120 kids. So you're also got, you also got like a hundred or you also got 40 kids who, who are either PWOs or walk-ons who are trying to earn scholarships. And then in lacrosse, you got, I think it's 12.6 scholarships for a roster of 45 to 55 kids. So, I mean, when you're getting an offer for football, it's like just gone off from ND mom, mom and dad don't have to pay my college tuition. Wow. And then it's like, when, when you get an offer from, for lacrosse, it's like, it's kind of more personal between you and the coaches because the financial piece is more personalized towards like your financial needs and like financial aid. Cause mm -hmm. that's honestly how the scholarships kind of, or that's how I think the scholarships work. It's more like a financial aid thing. Cause I've heard of kids who like could have all the money in the world and they're like, Oh, well, where this lacrosse program wants to offer you. And they're like, like no need, like give that offer to someone else. Like we are able to, mm. to like pay the tuition, which is very generous. But I mean, in football where you, you could be, you could be up here, you could be down here in your economic standing and they'd throw you, no matter how good you are, they'll throw you a full ride. And it's, it's just like, especially with this NIL deals now, mm. like kids are literally being sold to these programs. Like, they could write you a check for like 10,000 bucks to come play at their, at their program. And it's, mm. it's absurd. Mm. That like makes who, a lot of sense. Who, like who wouldn't want to get a check for 10 grand to go play football at, at a, like a top 10 school. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. What you're saying about lacrosse. It is personalized. You're not going to host just got a quarter, just got a third scholarship offer right. when it's, it's all different all over the place, how that's right. personalized. And I do agree with you that the NIL stuff is completely changing the recruiting in the way boosters now, I mean, it doesn't even have to be something crazy. Just be like friends of whatever, friends of Georgia football. What You know, all of a sudden you're getting a sponsorship for a collective pool, or whatever, and you're making X number of dollars to, and then that becomes the expectation. Oh, if you go here, this is how much money you'll make. Right. But it makes sense because for years and years and years, it's been college football, college basketball, all these sports has been making ridiculous amounts of money and these kids aren't getting anything. They can't, it's like the fab five documentary on 30 for 30, where these guys were like superheroes, the Michigan players, but they couldn't afford their own jerseys in a store. Right. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. This whole, this whole NIL thing for football has completely changed the game of recruiting. I mean, recruiting in general for football has always been crazy with the social media and just like publicity letting everybody know where you are like what you've been up to what school you just came from and now that you have like all these nil deals rolling in it's like it's like oh i'm a proud sponsor of blah 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 like here's a promo code to get 50% off. And then these kids are getting like commissioned off these discounts and like, whenever they use their promo code. It's crazy. All of a sudden, everyone's a liquid IV salesman. Oh, I know. It's crazy. And like, I, I got a couple of buddies who are playing football who have, who are like partnered with bucked up the pre-workout. No kidding. Yeah. And it's, and it's, um, you like put in his, his promo code and he's making like, I can't remember how much he's making off the sales, but it's like 30% off and then he's making some part of it. And it's crazy. Wow. How many lacrosse players do you think are actually able to make at least a little bit of money off NIL? I have to imagine the very elite guys are obviously going to be able to make money, but then guys at the bottom of rosters, I don't really know how much they'd be able to actually sell or advertise a product. Yeah. I think it's all based on publicity. Like, like the the name you build your for yourself on the field or in your community and all that stuff because um i mean lacrosse is slow it's i wouldn't say slowly growing into one of the biggest sports in our country but lacrosse is building a name for itself and it, and it's becoming more popular every year and 
I just think that by the time uh, – I, mean, I feel like by the time I'm out of school, like maybe these NIL deals are going to be hopping for these all these lacrosse recruits and maybe even that PLL is going to be making a, a bigger salary and all this stuff. So I think more and more money is going to be pumped into this sport, especially with all these investors like Katie's investing in the PLL, all, like the WWE. But then when you bring it back to the college game, it's – like when you go to a school like like Duke, Notre Dame, UNC, these big name lacrosse schools, Syracuse, uh, Maryland, like when you're on a roster like that and you let someone know and, and they're like, oh, well, if you're going to be, if there's the possibility you could be playing and starting and competing for a championship and all this stuff, like maybe we can work something out, like make, mm -hmm. are you making money. So I mean, I'm hoping that it becomes as big as football because, I mean, it deserves to. I mean, lacrosse is the fastest game on two feet. So, yeah. I mean, you got athletes. Like, I truly do believe that lacrosse does have some of the best athletes around. But, I mean, when you're competing with sports like basketball, football, and all that, that are, like, grown men absolutely putting their bodies on the line to make plays and, and getting drafted out of their first year of college and out of their first three years of college for the, for the football. It's, it's a t completely different animal. Mm -hmm. It is a strong aspect of the prospect of lacrosse growing really is the seasons. I think too, because baseball has been completely waning in their viewership and their its popularity in general. Um, and so lacrosse being college across in the spring and then like PLL, even into the summer, they're not competing with as many sports. So you're not competing directly against football or basketball for that space. So it would be really cool to see lacrosse kind of step in and be like, Oh, that's this big spring sport. Right. Um, I think a lot of people are seeing that and it's, it's exponentially grown in the last 10 or 15 years. The question is just what's, what's the ceiling for lacrosse. And some people think it could be one of those, dominant sports and a lot of people are like we'll see it's you know where where do you fall on that do you think lacrosse will take sort of a preeminent position yeah I, I do think so I mean with the world championship games going on right now you got teams from all around the world like that weren't previously in the world championships competing against powerhouses like Canada Australia USA obviously <laughs> but like the growth of the game isn't just growing within the country. It's growing all around the world. Mm. And it's pretty cool to see. It's just the availability to get gear and different apparel and all this, all like the publicity of the sport to different areas around the world is going to take some time just because it, it started out pretty small in, in the U S and then like, basketball and football and all that stuff that's a global brand it's just going to take some time to become the pll and college lacrosse is just going to take a little more time to become a global brand as well yeah it will it definitely will you wonder too just the ability of having less um high school programs ac across the country with the lower volume of players I think people have to realize too the opportunities that kids are getting to go you know, play, attend an Ivy League school, to go to a Notre Dame. There's so many brilliant academic opportunities too for someone that can apply themselves to the game of lacrosse. I, I think if parents saw that, a lot of communities would be like, hey, there's, there's opportunities here and there's more and more college programs coming into the mix. Right. And it's like the networking out of, out of college, like you – you're on a lacrosse team at a school like the three schools I listed before at ND, Duke, and UNC. You're set up for life. I mean, you got alumni who are starting multi million dollar companies. Mm -hmm. And if you, they have a choice between a guy fresh out of their alma mater or a guy from a random school, they're obviously going to pick the guy from their, from their right. college. I mean, and especially with these schools, like you said, being prestigious academic schools, it's literally setting you up for, for success in the long run. So mm -hmm. when you graduate with a diploma from one of those schools, you're, you're gold. Do you feel 
very positive about Notre Dame's prospects in the next few years. Do you see a national championship coming up? Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm always ambitious enough to think that every year we're going to we're going to compete for it. But um, I mean, I thought this past year we were going to compete for it, but uh, a little snubbing happened. But I think that with this class, my class coming in, we have a lot of talent. I mean, we have a bunch of athletes, a bunch of rangy, big, strong kids that can re- really make an impact, whether it's an immediate impact or whether it's one or two years down the road where some guys graduate and we got to fill in those spots and, and, and really make stuff happen. But um, I mean, also along with my class, the 23 class is, mm-hmm. is loaded with talent. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's, there's just so many great athletes and just lacrosse players in general that are coming in to South Bend that give me a lot of hope that we're going to compete for a long time. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. I tried to, yeah, I, it's, it's tough. Um, the like selection process too, just for the NCAA tournament. I think it was a lot of people hadn't seen the Ivy league for a year and they are kind of anxious to make sure they got their due. How do you like the way like this? Like actually it would be easiest for me if you just explain it. How does the selection process work for the tournament? I, I I honestly have no idea. I never I never watched the selection process, but um the one thing I do know is or the one thing I'm pretty sure I know is that if you win your conference, it's an automatic bid into the tournament. And as far as I know, Notre Dame and UVA were co ACC champs. Mm. So I feel like there's kind of a missing piece in the selection process that happened this past spring because. If Notre Dame and UVA are, are co ACC champs and UVA gets a bid, but ND doesn't, there's some there's some misconstrued like stuff happening. Right there. <laughs> Is that regular season? Is that the distinction and not the like uh, championship tournament? Is that what happened there? So I think I'm. I definitely should know this, but I <laughs> definitely don't. Um, cause the ACC is a lot smaller than I thought for lacrosse. I'm pretty sure there's only six schools. So I want to say they base it off of the regular season performance, whether it's head to head or, um, I mean, I know UVA beat ND, but I know that it was up to ND to win that final regular season game against Duke. And that was kind of going to determine whether or not they were going to be ACC champs or not. They ended up winning, became co-ACC champs with UVA. And that also, from what I heard from like Paul Carcaterra and all these announcers, that was supposed to give them the bid into the tournament. Hmm. And then once I heard that they didn't make the tournament, it just left me kind of like in awe because when I'm hearing all these different things that, all these big name guys are saying like it's their job to analyze this and and tell us what's happening and then it doesn't happen the way it's supposed to kind of leaves me with thinking that there's something wrong in this process yeah Yeah, absolutely and like you said it is a smaller conference that you think like nc state we we have a club team clemson has a club team bc has a club team which is actually kind of regrettable i feel like because so many great lacrosse players around here i think i know with with lacrosse i mean there's kids that like like we were talking about earlier you grow up you go to like the bc versus notre dame football game there's kids around here who would be jumping at the opportunity to go on a varsity boston college lacrosse team oh i mean i would have i mean my dad went to bc played football there and i grew up on that campus in chestnut hill so Mm -hmm. um like if that if there were two schools that I ever wanted to go to, it was always ND and BC. I mean, it would have been unbelievable if they had a, uh, a team, which my, I mean, my dad, when he was playing football at BC, he, he went up to the lacrosse coach and was like, I really want to play. Cause he had experience in, in high school and um, the coach wouldn't let him play because he, he knew like what he, what his potential was with football. And so he told him like, you're I'm not letting you play like <laughs> no shot you're playing lacrosse 
Yeah. What do you think a lot of people have been speculating lately about Boston College football? I know you're a fan. I'm a fan. It's really frustrating to see when we have so many great players in our backyard. And obviously, it's up to everyone's individual decision. I totally get going to this place or that place. I'm upset mostly just at like BC as a program. I'm like, when we have so much talent, we got to be able to land some of these amazing players from the ISL, MIA, New England in general, all these four or five star football players that just seems like we're hard to build a program if you can't win in the backyard. I know. Um, I mean, I, I hear it from my dad every day and it's almost becoming annoying, but <laughs> like, I mean, I got, I want to say what the 23 class in Massachusetts right now is probably the best class that's ever been through Massachusetts. You got like, it's littered with like four stars, just mm-hmm. one or two, five stars in there. And it's just, I'm going to bring it back to this like NIL and like the fact of competing for national championships that like these kids want to go play at the best possible program that they want, that they can. And whether that means like getting a deal that cuts them a check for a certain amount of money or being told that they're going to start. But then when they get to school, they realize that they're just a small fish in a big ass pond. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's like ND is on or not ND BC is on the rise in my opinion in football. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, Joe Griffin mm-hmm. from Springfield central. I mean, when he committed to BC, that was like, what, that was one of the <laughs> happiest days of my dad's life because <laughs> that kid is a freak of nature. And my dad is still in contact with a bunch of these BC coaches and they tell him like, this kid, Joe, like he's, he's going to play. Like he's, he's the guy, he's, yeah. he, he's our guy. And it's crazy to think that this kid's a four-star athlete and they can land one of them, but not a lot of kids want to follow Joe and like want to go play yeah. right away and want to go compete in the ACC. I mean, ACC is a power five program Who yeah. will, will compete there. Like people, like, I feel like kids got to realize that once, once you leave Massachusetts, you're not as good as you think. I mean, it's it's crazy for me to say because I'm not a football player anymore. Mm-hmm. But for hearing it from my dad, who to me is a very reliable source. Right, yeah, I'd say so. It's crazy that, like, these kids wouldn't want to play for their hometown team. Like, there's no team out here, like, that touches BC. I mean, I th- I'm pretty sure BC and UMass are the only two – like true football programs out here. And it's like, who wouldn't want to stay home, put Boston across their chest and put, put the school on the map and try to com- ma- try to make sure that they're competing for, for either an ACC championship or, or slowly progressing in, in competing for a national championship. Like, I feel like BC could be a place that, can land all these legit recruits but it's just the fact that these kids want to go play at the very best school in the country and they don't realize that they're going to be competing with freaks of nature like there Mm. are kids from down south and out west that play football year round unlike Mm. we do like they they don't see snow on the turf they they don't have to worry about shoveling off a little portion of the turf during the winter to go get some footwork or go get some running. And like, these guys can wake up whenever they want, mm. go run, become freakishly fast when, whenever and wherever. And we have to worry about like, we face the adversity of, Oh shoot, there's snow on the ground. Like got to go find an in- indoor facility. And especially recently with, COVID and all this stuff where indoor facilities kind of had to shut down and limit the the capacity that they could hold. It's, it's just, I don't know. It just, it baffles me because if I ever had an opportunity to go play football at BC, like it would be a no brainer besides mm-hmm. the fact that I'm probably going to like one of the greatest schools that mm-hmm. I could ever think of, but that's just coming from a kid whose dad went to that school. But um that's 
my opinion, that's that it just it's crazy to me that these kids from out here don't want to put Boston across their chest and rep the hometown and rep the home city and and put it on the map. Mm, I think you're right too that they see the opportunities. Oh, a national championship here, here at this more established school. I would speculate if football was more similar to lacrosse in the way when I talk to you from your club experiences, you go, oh, I know Chad Palumbo. I know Tommy Sarney. I know all these guys are going D1. They're my buddies. And then even like the way you were talking about how Brock and you were coordinating, you were talking about going to Notre Dame. I think if you have such an exceptional class like this, this like we do this year in Massachusetts and in New England, if these guys were as interconnected as lacrosse players, I think there's a lot higher likelihood they could have all said like, hey, maybe if we all go to BC, like the hometown kids, we could really do something and really change around this program in the ACC. The thing is, I don't think kids like Joe Griffin know all the other like guys. Like the, He probably doesn't personally know Samson Okanala or Andrew Rapplier or Ronan Hannafin. Right. But if, I bet if those guys all knew each other, there'd be a chance maybe you'd get fucking half of the top 15 guys in Mass and just say, hey, let's all run BC. Let's just go. Let's you know, be the hometown guys. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Like if there was, I mean, it'd be crazy if there was, but if there was like club football where all these kids are competing against other teams from different states, I feel like that would totally happen. Like all these kids are building relationships, connections, Mm -hmm. then they feel more comfortable and more likely to like reach out to each other and be like, let's go build something of our own instead of join something that's already established. Like it's, it's crazy. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. I'm yeah. I'm optimistic. We'll we'll see if any it's just yeah. A historic program. I mean it's like Doug Flutie, native right. guy. Native right. guy, right? Crazy man. He, he went out there, he went to BC as a defensive back. Did he back. really? Went went as a defensive back. The my dad my dad knows this, but he he says that either the first string quarterback got hurt and then the second string quarterback shit the bed third string quarterback also shit the bed Hmm. and they were like what the hell are we gonna do that's why flutie wears wore number 22 he was a defensive back whoa threw flutie in there takes him down on his very first drive in a game takes him down and scores they found their quarterback damn crazy that's wild. My uh, grandfather passed away in, in like, he was like 40 in his forties. Um, but he had been the, a very successful, he was like hall of uh, Massachusetts high school hall of fame football coach at Natick. Yeah. And he would have been there, you know, it was probably passed away a few years before Flutie came. And my grandma always jokes. He's like, or someone, someone said like, if he had been alive, no one ever would have ever heard of Doug Flutie because he would have put him as the halfback in like a power eye formation. Funny. Because <laughs> he always just put the best athletes right there. Right. These little things like that. He comes in as a defensive back. You never know these kind of twists of fate, how they're going to work out. I know. Yeah. We chatted a little bit before. You said there's still some interest uh, if like an opportunity came up to play football at Notre Dame. Yeah, I mean, I've always thought of myself as a football player first. And I, I mean, football's always been the first love. Mm-hmm. But, and like, I've honestly been obsessed with it for as long as I can remember. But, um, I mean, if the opportunity ever presents itself, I'd look into it. But I'm fully, fully committed to this lacrosse thing. I mean, I, I got a bunch of guys that I want to go win a national championship with. I got to a great group of buddies that I'm about to go embark on a crazy journey with. So um, if football can find its way back into my life or I can find my way back into football, I mean, I forever be grateful for that because ever since that last, uh, that last football game, high school football game, I've, I've always reminisced football and thought of like, there's still plays that go through my head that I'm like, Mm -hmm. shit, if I like position myself here and then, kind of baited the cue because I played free safety. If I position myself here, kind of weave in my backpedal, bait the QB, 
maybe he'll think I'm I'm committing this way. Now he throws it backside, and now I'm here, and now he bites on my fake, and now I go pick it off. And there's plays where I'm like, I'm like man, man, like I could, I could have made something out of that. And I'm like, like damn, mm-hmm. I wish I had one more chance to go do that. Yeah. 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 I think a lot of people feel that way. It was, you know, an incredible last year at BBNN, that team, just su- such a special team. Um, I'd love to talk to more Milton, um, lo- love to talk to more BBNN football players too. Cause I feel like I interviewed all the Milton Academy football players yeah. and I haven't done the BBNN. And I know you guys had such an incredible roster. I actually, fun fact, I, the only school after my senior year of football, the only, after I had my shoulder done, the only school I sent my senior year tape to was BC. Mm-hmm. And they told me, I go, is this, I sent it to their recruiting coordinator, Joe Sullivan. I, t- I sent him a, a DM over Twitter. I said, is this good enough to receive a full scholarship offer? And he said, yes, the most I can give you right now is a PWO though, because we are all out of scholarships. Wow. Yeah. That's a, that must've been a weird feeling. I know it was like bittersweet. I was like, damn, at least I know. Yeah. Yeah. At least, you know, you could play at that power five level. Right. Damn. Are there a lot of kids from ISL schools at BC? So, um, kid from that graduated from nobles, Drew Kendall was slotted to be a starting center this year. So I'm, I, I haven't heard much about BC camp and all that, but I'm sure, I'm sure he's doing well over there. Um, who else is there? Another kid that I played FBU with, he did not an ISL kid, but he went to Catholic Memorial. His name's Owen McGowan. Oh yeah. Yeah. He's a beast at linebacker. So I'm, I'm wondering, I'm going to ask my dad to see how he's doing over there. But um, I mean, my dad's always like, going to campus like we're going to watch practice going to see all the scrimmages and all that stuff so so he he's always got an insight to it cm cm is basically isl yeah they could compete they were they recruit better than you guys oh yeah (laughs) yeah they'll never say it it's uh, all jokes all jokes yeah (laughs) they could be an isl they'd be a very competitive isl team yeah how do you think bbnn versus cm last year would have looked I mean, I'm always going to back my boys. So I, I always think we're going to win no matter what we do. But uh, I definitely think it'd be a great game. I mean, yeah. they got talent all over the board. Mm. I saw football is different, though. I saw you got to be a different type of like smash mouth team to play in the ISL. Mm. And I bet you, like, if a lot of team, if a, a lot of kids from different teams told you about the, our BBNN team last year, we were a physical defense. Like, mm. That's the one thing we pride ourselves on, which is coming down and like no regard for our body, no regard for your body. Like it, it's on, like, you yeah, just come down and hit like crazy. Yeah. What kind of things this summer have you been preparing in your game um, and working on to make sure you can take that jump to play at Notre Dame? Definitely my offhand, my left hand, just because I've been in a, been in a sling for, forever i mean my joint will never be the same just because i had the bone graft screwed in here so just like being able to comfortably shoot on the run i mean passing is always going to be there passing is always a skill i'll have with that hand but like shooting on the run catching and step downs like cutting through the middle with that left hand catching it and finishing in tight areas is definitely one thing i focused on a lot this summer just because I mean, that left arm been out of commission. I was told when once I was like three months out of surgery, I was told like the one thing I can't do yet is use my left arm with my stick. Hmm. All righty during the spring, like I'd warm up some of our goalies and I just couldn't use my left. Like my trainer, who I love, her Kathy, um, at BBNN, she'd come out to practice. And if I had my stick in my left hand, She'd ride, she'd drive the little golf cart over and tell me to cut it out or else I was going to like have to go home. But, uh, so I'd always keep the stick in my right hand during the spring. So once it Did came- that really help develop that offhand? I mean, yeah. I mean, it's, it's progressed a lot recently. Definitely. I mean, 
working with the trainer too to get the power behind it was definitely a big thing and then just working the mechanic Mm -hmm. mechanics of it yeah of course final question for you thomas what's a what's a piece of advice you would give to a young player that wants to get to where you're at now and play division one lacrosse I'd say there's definitely some sacrifices that you got to make in order to get to a level like this. Um, I mean, I'm, I've always been someone who like, likes to have fun with my buddies, but when it comes, when you're obsessed over something and you really want something badly, you'll, you'll find a way to go get it. And that means like sacrificing going out to like parties or like going, hanging out with your buddies just to go like, whether it's running or like getting on the wall or get getting shots. And that's one thing I, that was like a sour thing I had to accept be just because I want, I was like obsessed with it. And when you're obsessed with something, you're going to do it to the fullest extent that you, you can. So if, that, if there's one thing I can say is like, you have to accept the sacrifices that you have to make or else you will not be satisfied with the end result. Mm-hmm. Well said, Thomas, thanks so much for coming on the young Shakespeare podcast. Appreciate you, Dan. I had a ton of fun on here. Yeah, me too. It was awesome interviews. Thanks so much to Thomas for coming on the show. Thanks so much to everyone who's listening, watching, liking, subscribing, and please tune in to the next episode of the Young Shakespeare Podcast.